The long-awaited and most anticipated fight in Jujutsu Kaisen, Satoru Gojo vs. Ryoma Sukuna is finally over. I had already picked my winner three years ago, as I've said previously, and I was wrong. I had to wait to write this video until I got over all of my rage and could actually see the new chapter for what it was. Today I want to talk about the chapter itself, Gojo and Sukuna's dynamic, and look at the fight in retrospect. For the sake of just not making predictions, I'm going to refrain from bringing up any theories regarding Gojo's revival and if that will happen, so watch the rest of this video under the pretense that the 6 size user has been put down permanently. Before we begin, I'd like to ask if you leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel, as YouTube shows me more than half of the people who watch my videos aren't subscribing, but let's begin. Obviously, before talking about any of the stuff, we have to cover the chapter itself first. Chapter 236 opens with Geto saying hi to Gojo, and Gojo being obviously mad about the fact that Geto is here with him in the afterlife, going as far as to say as he hopes this is a dream because he tells his students when they pass away, they're alone. Geto asks Gojo how his fight with the King of Curses was, and Gojo claims Sukuna was insanely strong and he wasn't giving it his all. He then goes on to say he's not sure if he could have beaten him even if he didn't have Megami's 10 Shadows technique. Gojo then says he feels a bit sorry for Sukuna. He can empathize with the magnitude of his sheer solitude more than anyone else. He loves everyone and doesn't feel lonely now, but somewhere along the way there was a line he drew, not as a human, but as a living creature. He explains what he meant by saying, you can make a flower bloom, you can admire it, but you can't tell that flower, I want you to understand me. Gojo continuing his monologue says the skills he drilled into his tempered body, his refined senses, even his haphazard tactics and explosive power, he gave it his all. He wanted to convey everything to Sukuna, he wanted him to know, and he had fun. He reiterates Sukuna wasn't able to give him his all in return, which he feels sorry for. Gojo exclaims how he's happy to have met his end against a stronger opponent rather than illness or old age, and that's when a young Nanami and Haibara show up. I want to save this dialogue for something I'm going to talk about later, so for now I'm going to skip it. We cut to Gojo after his dream and he's not in good shape whatsoever, just blankly looking into the sky as he barely holds on to life. To address the elephant in the room, no, we don't get to see the attack that ended Gojo, which is a gigantic miss on Akutami's part in my opinion, and definitely the worst thing about this chapter. The dialogue in the afterlife was good and all, great even, but Gojo's end happening off screen is very jarring and I don't think I'll ever like it. The fact that he got beat is whatever, it's just really strange that we didn't get to see it. Sukuna starts explaining the way we got to this point, at least seemingly. Maharaga's adaptation process slowly starts analyzing once it receives an initial attack, and it's complete after a certain amount of time. During that process, if it receives additional attacks, the completion time is sped up. Not only does it ensure adaptation of the first Jujutsu, but the analysis doesn't stop and the adaptation continues. What he wanted from Maharaga was a model, a model in order for him to breach Gojo's inviolability. The first time that Maharaga adapted to Infinity, it transmuted its own cursed energy in order to neutralize and nullify it. That was something Sukuna couldn't do, so he waited until he could obtain an adaptation that would match Infinity, and the second adaptation proceeded as he wanted to. That wasn't meant to be a slash like the ones he launched. That was the extension of the cursed technique's target. Its target was not Gojo. It extended all the way to space, existence, and the world themselves so to cut them without regard for Gojo's infinity. So long as it exists inside that space, that world, those existences would split apart. It's an incredibly difficult technique to obtain, but he did have a wonderful model. Sukuna then says Gojo was magnificent and he won't ever forget him so long as he lives. Then, without taking a moment to mourn Satoru Gojo's death, soaring to the battlefield was the god of lightning, Hajime Kashimo. If you asked me when this chapter came out what I thought of it, I would have told you it was the worst thing I had ever read and Gege ruined the story. But after getting through the rage of losing Gojo, I've come to like it a lot more. That being said, there are a few things I need to explain about this chapter since there is tons of misinformation and misinterpretations surrounding it. The first being how Sukuna was able to actually cut through infinity. Sukuna's new interpretation of his curse technique allows him to target the space that a specific target exists in, so instead of hitting you with the technique, he hits the space you exist in 
which would by proxy hit you anyway, regardless of your defenses as anything you could do like reinforce your body with cursed energy or in Gojo's case cover in a barrier happen within the space of that universe. Gojo's curse technique is only a simulated infinity anyway, there's not an actual infinite amount of distance between Gojo and his opponents, but considering the infinite division of speed as things approach him, the simulated infinity can exist in a finite space, kind of like how between 1 meter and 2 meters, you could write 1.9999999999 meters infinitely and the number would never hit 2 meters. I don't want to get too far into this because I want to explain Sukuna's technique, but this has the potential to be extremely broken. If these slashes don't get sent flying and instead target space just before being unleashed, it may be a sure hit technique even outside of a domain. What makes me believe this even more is that Gojo should have been able to see the spark or occurrence in Sukuna before he launched the technique and dodged it considering his recent amps due to Black Flash and his six eyes. This is the issue with having this happen off screen. We don't really know what happened for it to get to this point. But I think that's a fine enough explanation for how he actually hit Gojo with his broad and cursed technique. The next thing I want to touch on is the idea that Gojo's character was ruined by this chapter and more specifically by Nanami's dialogue. It's like I told Geto a long time ago, why not just let Gojo take care of everything by himself from now on? Gojo lives for Jujutsu, he doesn't wield it to protect something, he uses it solely for the sake of satisfying himself, he's a weirdo. Tons of people have been saying this is a blatant character assassination, but I couldn't disagree more. Nanami saying Gojo doesn't wield Jujutsu to protect anything and uses it solely for the sake of satisfying himself is true. I think a lot of people's issue with this is that it seems to contradict what Gojo wants for his students, but that just isn't the case. I want everyone to think about why Gojo wants to foster this strong and intelligent group of sorcerers. Why is that? It's because he doesn't like the way things are currently ran in Jujutsu society, so he uses his political influence whenever he can to get strong people to also help him change it, like say staying off the planned execution of Yuji or Yuta or the fact that he went and got Megami before the Zenin clan could, it's all for Gojo's dream and what he wants. While he obviously doesn't ignore the students and he does care for them, that isn't what's being said here. What Nanami is talking about is why Gojo fights when he does fight. After Toji and prior to Sukuna, Gojo was the strongest and no one could even rival him in power. What's left for the guy who can't be understood by absolutely anyone among superhumans and even less so by regular people? All he can do is have a good time when he battles. Think about what Gojo says to Jogo during his domain expansion. Ironic isn't it, given everything but unable to do anything, dying slowly. This is essentially Gojo's life post awakening. Also, people wondering how Gojo is able to pass away without regrets? Let's look at how Gojo left things. The higher ups are all gone with Gakuganji taking over. He got to go all out and have fun in a fight one time and he weakened Sukuna greatly leaving room for other people to come in and potentially take him down. What is there for him to regret? Let's talk about Gojo and Sukuna's dynamic as well as looking at the fight in retrospect. I'm going to start with explaining a bit about Gojo and the line he drew between him and the rest of life thanks to being the strongest. I like to think of infinity as a physical representation of that line. Think about when infinity became truly passive and active at all times. It's right after Gojo awakened thanks to Toji's efforts. And this is very literal. I mean as soon as Gojo gets done explaining the always active limitless, the narrator or Geto, whichever you think, say this quote about him becoming the strongest. Gojo also starts taking on missions alone around this time, but that's all just to support what I'm saying. I think this is why Gojo appears in his teenage form in the afterlife, as it's the last time he doesn't feel this complete loneliness, and it's before he drew this line between himself and the rest of life. Gojo, since he died to someone stronger than he was, is no longer Satoru Gojo the strongest, he's now just Gojo. Again, beyond that, Infinity is also something that sort of stops Gojo from ever getting what he really wanted. Even in this fight with Sukuna, Gojo mentions how he's upset that Sukuna was unable to give it his all when fighting him. 
And that's due to this barrier. Whether you believe the barrier only acted as temptation for Sukuna to advance his curse technique, you think that Sukuna couldn't give it his all because a lot of his moves wouldn't work past infinity, or some combination interpretation of the two, it doesn't matter because those are just the reasons. The end result is Sukuna couldn't or wouldn't go all out against Gojo, and that's what Gojo really wanted. Now I want to switch things over to Sukuna's side and talk about how, for him, Gojo was sort of like a Toji. Sukuna went into this fight, or at least at some point in the fight, he decided that he was going to use Maharaga to adapt to infinity and learn how to expand his curse technique. Gojo is the only person that something like this would be possible against, because he's the only person who wields infinity. Sukuna is very satisfied being the strongest or being misunderstood because nothing matters to him aside from his own pleasure and excitement. This idea is why Gojo could never reach Sukuna. Sukuna would never care about understanding someone else or anything. He exists solely for himself and himself alone. Even if Sukuna is weaker than Gojo, or even if he couldn't beat him, he'd just simply aim higher. He's unreachable at that type of level. The only way to reach Sukuna is to beat him, because losing is everything to someone who only cares about himself. He took part in this fight only to go higher and to ascend to an even more godly level than he was already at. Sukuna is perfectly fine not being able to go all out, or not being able to give it his all, if that means that in the end his curse technique will be unstoppable and he will be better. This is why Sukuna calls Gojo an ordinary guy or mediocre whenever Gojo can't expand his domain anymore. Gojo was unable to force that evolution that Sukuna desired, he was unable to make him reach new heights and here he is about to be ended like everyone else who fought Sukuna before. But when Sukuna really gets what he wants, when he finally gets that expanded interpretation and it's on his last legs, Gojo did what he wanted and that's why Sukuna says he was magnificent and he'll never forget him for the rest of his life. This idea that Gojo is Sukuna's Toji is true even down to the outfit that Gojo is wearing. He's literally wearing the clothes Toji had on when Gojo awakened. That's basically just what I think of this and how I interpret everything here at the very end of the fight. But you can obviously let me know your interpretation of things if they differ from mine in the comments. Now to look at the fight in retrospect and mainly ask ourselves and hopefully answer, was Sukuna holding back? And if so, what does that mean? A lot of us were taken by complete surprise when Gojo said Sukuna was holding back because for most of the fight, Gojo was in control. But then he says that Sukuna was holding back. This just doesn't seem to make sense. So as far as the first question, was Sukuna holding back? The answer is blatantly yes, but that's the lesser important of the questions if you ask me. The more important questions are why was he holding back and what does it mean? These sort of have to be answered simultaneously, so bear with me while I go through this. If we want to look at this in the simplest of ways, Sukuna didn't go all out because his full power would be too much for Gojo. But that's a rather boring way to look at it, and it's not very indicative of a fight taking place in this story. After all, Sukuna used his domain expansion and amplified it by shortening the range to destroy the barrier on Gojo's domain. So in what way was he holding back? He wasn't able to use all of the things at his disposal. Due to his plan for Gojo's domain, he had Megumi taking the brunt of Gojo's unlimited void in order for Maharaga to adapt to it in order to rid Gojo of that card in his deck. You could say an unexpected outcome from this for Sukuna by the way he chooses to engage the situation is that Gojo wouldn't be able to expand his domain after doing five of them, but he only came to discover that during the times they were repeatedly healing their brains. After all, Sukuna does say the reason for having Maharaga adapt was to rid Gojo of Unlimited Void, but Gojo also sort of does that to himself? I'm also fairly certain it's not in Sukuna's plan to have his domain stripped from him by taking Unlimited Void for close to 10 seconds, and that's made pretty apparent by himself when he says that he's going to expand his domain and adapt to infinity while he's at it. Speaking of which, I don't exactly know what he meant here because inside of his domain, 
there would be no way to adapt to infinity since the attacks would just reach gojo anyway but that's whatever i'm sure he had some way i guess what i'm getting at here is gojo got to use all of his techniques he got to use blue to his maximum red to his maximum purple to his maximum his neutral limitless his domain expansion bro he even got to use four black flashes he got to use everything that he has access to but sakuna didn't get to use Zerozu's gift he didn't get to open the black box he didn't get to use his fire arrows and he was limited to using the 10 shadows or domain amplification just to hit gojo properly all because of infinity so why did sakuna hold back because he had to since infinity prevents him from going all out and what does sakuna holding back mean it means that he couldn't use his entire arsenal as far as whether or not gojo could have beaten sakuna if he didn't have megami's curse technique I guess we'll never really have an answer to this one within the series, but in my opinion he would be able to. Let me explain why before someone just blindly claims Gojo would win. I'll say that when Gojo flipped the conditions of his domain, he did mention how Sukuna went for the intentionally harder route of dealing with it rather than just destroying it from the inside. We know now that was due to wanting Maharaga to adapt. Gojo doesn't say this would have worked, he just says that Sukuna took the harder route when destroying it from the outside. He also mentions how Sukuna is not using 10 shadows inside the domain, but we know this is because Sukuna can't while having Megami also use the move, so he can only use the moves of his domain. This being said, I think the last of the clashes was a genuine representation of how a clash between Gojo and Sukuna would go. But it's also possible for Sukuna to change his plan of attack in those last clashes. Keep in mind, the binding vow that strengthened Sukuna's sure hit when he turned it off inside of Gojo's domain was voided because he started turning the sure hit back on as Gojo makes clear at the end of chapter 228. So in the last three clashes, if Sukuna did choose to turn it off inside the domain, He'd have to somehow keep contact with Gojo while the barrier gets destroyed from the outside as nothing would be protecting him from an unlimited void otherwise. I don't think it's very plausible to say Sukuna would just keep contact with Gojo for a now unspecified amount of time due to an unknown strength boost in his sure hit which would maybe shorten the time it takes to destroy Gojo's domain significantly or not. It's kind of unknown. As for if Sukuna would have learned this mega hyperspace slash without Maharaga or not, again, we have no idea. But I think using Maharaga for it likely shows us he wouldn't have if just fighting Gojo normally, or at least he wouldn't have in the same amount of time, which would likely lead to a Gojo W anyway. But like I said, ignoring any revival theories, Sukuna is now the strongest sorcerer.